Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. Pop quiz, hotshot. What was the first movie musical of the modern era to feature a cast performing the songs entirely live on set? <coughs> Wrong, but thank you for playing. It's true, Les Miserables did make a big deal of its actors performing without a pre-recorded safety net, but it was not the first modern film to employ this technique. That trail was blazed by a largely forgotten 1975 movie called At Long Last Love. After watching it, you'll realize why it's been largely forgotten. Director Peter Bogdanovich conceived At Long Last Love as a tribute to the musicals of the 1930s using the songs of one of that era's greatest composers, Cole Porter. The musicals of Porter's heyday were usually short on plot and long on songs that were catchy, entertaining, and marketable. Keep that in mind the next time you hear people complaining about how commercial Broadway has become. Despite starring the likes of Sybil Shepard, Burt Reynolds, Madeline Kahn, and Eileen Brennan, At Long Last Love tanked at the box office and for a long time was the Star Wars holiday special of movie musicals, available only in various second-hand bootlegs. Then last June, the definitive director's version was released on Blu-ray, pleasing devotees who claim the movie is much better than its reputation indicates. We shall see about that. Let's examine the case of At Long Last Love. The <laughs> story concerns the travails of four Depression-era New Yorkers. The first one we meet is soused actress Kitty O'Kelly, who in the opening scene is breaking up with some guy we'll never see again. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting. You love Doc Rowe. Yeah. Like a bat. I'd rather be a bat than a duck. Hmm. Thought I was a weasel. Hmm. You are a weasel and a duck. What? You might as well get used to that kind of thing, because the faux witty dialogue is sin number one. Nobody in this movie has an actual conversation. They have carefully rehearsed quips that they recite without any timing or energy. My mother's in South America. And your father? My father isn't in South America. Even Madeline Kahn, one of the funniest women to ever grace the screen, can't do anything with this stuff. Theatricality, my dear, is your department. Very clever. Clever. It's like a bunch of rejected Oscar Wilde characters got plastered and made a home movie. The other members of the quartet are Johnny Spanish, an Italian gambler who hides his hand-to-mouth existence with a sophisticated veneer and an accent thick enough to pour over fettuccine. I say this to myself in Venice, and here I am. You should have stayed in Venice. Brooke Carter, an heiress who spends her checks from mummy faster than she gets them. This says we are being thrown out, so something is wrong. When gray should one is it sunset or it's sunrise? Well, when you figure it out, call me. And Michael Oliver Pritchard III, whose main characteristics are being rich and bored. Tired of dining, tired of whining, tired of teen, tired of being tired. The four of them are introduced in a clunky first act that's sin number two. Each character comes on screen, trades a few lines of bad dialogue with someone, sings a song that supposedly tells us something about them but really doesn't, and then it's off to the next completely disconnected scene. I get that they're establishing these characters as individuals before the circumstances of the movie throw them together, but it makes for a tedious opening. Although that's a pretty good indicator of what you can expect from the rest of the film. You ever get bored? Never. You will be. You will be. So Mike and Kitty meet cute when his driver nearly runs her over and he's thrown from the car into her arms. Mr. Pritchard, are you hurt? No, I landed on something soft. Oh, you charmer. Could you call an ambulance? I think you broke my pelvis. <laughs> Meanwhile, Brooke goes to the racetrack to gamble her remaining allowance into enough money to cover her hotel bill, where she meets Johnny when she tries to shop her way ahead of him in the betting line. You're Italian. You're Venetian. Mm, every Italian I've ever met is rude, inconsiderate, and selfish. Well, you two should get along just fine, then. But despite a rocky start, Brooke's bet doesn't pay off, so she butters up Johnny so she can mooch off of him. 
and sure enough, he agrees to foot her hotel expenses, earning him what little affection she has to spare for other people. So before you know it, both couples are so thoroughly infatuated with each other that they end up singing You're the Top. You're the top. You're the diamond holder. You're the moon of a May West shoulder. This is one of the few songs in the movie that kind of works, because the back and forth of the lyrics allows the actors to play off of each other a little. Also, it's one of the best things Porter wrote, which makes it kind of hard to screw up. But it is, unfortunately, one of the rare exceptions to sin number three, the static musical numbers. Say what you will about Les Mis, the live performances did help give the songs a dramatic arc and emotional intensity. The technique doesn't really add anything in At Long Last Love, because the songs are rarely used in a dramatic fashion, and when they are, they don't move the scene forward much. About halfway through the movie, we get the title song, which each of the main characters sings in turn. Vocally, the performances are... well, they're not any better or worse than Russell Crowe, make of that what you will. But dramatically, there's no sense that they're struggling with the main question of the song. Am I in love or not? The number stagnates as a result, and after about the third verse of someone just swanning around singing to themselves, it gets old. Eventually, all four characters meet at the premiere of Kitty's new show, where Brooke makes herself a nuisance by demanding the only seat in the row with an unobstructed view of the stage. Let's put the ones I bought were together, see? Six and seven, you're in seven. Well, what's wrong with that one? Well, that's nine. You're being very literal. How dare you expect to sit in the seats you paid for? Look what you've done. What? King Kong's wife. How dare people be taller than me? We're switching again, Junior, because you got such terrific seats. Uh. How dare you not research the heights of the people sitting in front of us before you purchase tickets? Lord of Darkness knows why she even bothered, since now she has to put up with sin number four. Find me a primitive man. This song has not aged well. I could be the personal slave of someone just out of a cave. I mean, sure, Cole Porter could get away with writing a song about wanting a man to be a brute and rip your clothes off in the 1930s, but this movie was made in 1975. What's Bogdanovich's excuse? And the choreography is... I'm not sure what to make of it. <laughs> Is this supposed to be bad or not? It's certainly not good, but it's not funny enough to feel like its badness is the point of the scene. In fact, that's an accurate summary of this whole movie. It's not funny enough to be a parody of silly 1930s musicals, and it's not good enough to be a genuine homage to them. Brooke recognizes Kitty as an old school friend of hers, so the four of them go out for a night on the town, which mostly involves a lot of drinking and an interminable rendition of friendship. Friendship, friendship, just the perfect blendship. When all their friendships have ceased to gel, ours will still be swell. La, 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 la. Ha, ha, ha. And by now, we've all become painfully aware of sin number five. Nothing happens in this movie. The entire plot is summarized by a music box in the opening credits. There are two couples, they switch partners, the end. Everything else is just a bunch of boring, shallow people doing boring, shallow things and being absorbed by their boring, shallow problems. Everybody is so petty and self-centered they make the cast of The Great Gatsby look like Franciscan monks, but the worst is certainly Brooke a spoiled princess whose every line comes out as a sullen pout or an angry bark. Just to give you an idea of how horrible she is, here's her backstory. Your father in the crash. Crash? So what you do? You have no money. Dad was a silly part of the whole thing. Daddy thought we were broke, but he just didn't know mother. He didn't know your mother? Not too well. I see. She had about a million dollars hidden around the house. My goodness. <laughs> oh, no, no. Gary Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> So what happened to your mother? She went down to South America. And she left you no money. Oh, a little. And ah. she sends more every so ah. often. But lately it hasn't been so often. In fact, we haven't heard from her in three months. Yeah, 
Dad swan dived onto Wall Street, and her mom is in who knows what kind of trouble abroad, but the important thing is she's not getting her allowance. What is this, First World Problems the musical? This movie doesn't need me, it needs an Occupy movement. Or maybe the kangaroo court from Dark Knight Rises. Death! By exile. The quartet head out for a weekend in the country. Believe me, if I could spend the rest of the review quoting Sondheim, we'd all be a lot happier. Along with Mike's valet, Rodney, and Elizabeth Brooks. Maid? Companion? Person she pays to be her friend because nobody else will put up with her? Elizabeth takes an immediate liking to Rodney, because everybody in this movie needs to be paired up. And while the servants serve, the one percenters engage in the typical activities of carefree youth, including business casual football, <laughs> trolling old people, Have you heard? It's in the stars. Next July we collide with Mars. Well, did you ever? What a swell party this is. And encouraging drunk driving. <laughs> By this time, Brooke's ardor towards Johnny has cooled, mostly because he's not as fabulously wealthy as she initially believed. So she goes slow dancing under the moonlight with Mike. Is that thing itchy? What thing? Thing on your lip. Oh. And finally, nearly an hour and fifteen minutes in, we get some conflict. Or a close approximation. Kitty and Johnny come upon their S.O.s and return to the city in a huff. Mike feels briefly guilty about this, but Brooke hasn't had any scruples about her behavior up till this point and certainly isn't going to start now. Want a drink? Meanwhile, Johnny and Kitty plot to make the other two feel bad about dumping them by acting like they're in love to make their exes insanely jealous. If it surprises you to learn that Kitty and Johnny's play-acting romance will become the real thing, and that the other two will get a little jealous about it, and that they'll all think they need to go back to their original partners even though none of them really want to, then I have some facts about the direction of the sun's rising and the religion of the Pope that should interest you. But for now, let's discuss sin number six. There's no reason to care who ends up with who in the first place. None of the pairings are better or worse than any other, and nobody seems any happier with their new partners than they were with the last ones. And if it doesn't make a difference, where's the conflict? Unless you're worried about who gets stuck with Brooke and her attitude. Meanwhile, Elizabeth continues her pursuit of Rodney, which I'm calling sin number seven on because it's awkward and makes little sense. Rodney's not particularly attractive or interesting, apart from being the only unattached male, and he treats her with the same deadpan snarky servant attitude he gives everyone, which is hardly encouraging. But Elizabeth persists, and it eventually starts to get creepy. I do double entry, dear, but in the morning, no, no, yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, 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 no. Seriously, imagine that scene with the genders reversed and tell me it's not squicky. Finally, after several scenes of being taunted by the manufactured lovebirds, Mike can't stand the fact that Kitty has gotten over him so easily and goes to confront Johnny in the men's room. <laughs> oh, that was a close one. Something interesting almost happened on screen. So, with the ruse being revealed, both couples split up and Johnny goes to a big poker game, which he's certain will make him rich and therefore worthy of Brooke again. This movie keeps reminding me of movies I'd rather be watching instead of it. But it was just one. Of those He's looking at you, kid. I've had every thrill from a Rolls Royce to a Ford. I'm laughing at clouds so dark up above. Come on, cotton ball, yes, move it! Come on, Dover! Move your blooming ass! 
so everybody is alone and miserable, and I'm miserable because we're mired in the middle of sin number eight, the contrived third act breakup. You know, the scene in nearly every romantic comedy where the leads separate, usually due to some misunderstanding that could be cleared up with five minutes of conversation, but instead is dragged out so that we can all pretend that there's a chance they might not get together after all, even though we all know they will? Yeah, that part. It's particularly annoying here because it's never really explained why nobody's speaking to anybody else. They just go off and wallow in self-pity until chance throws them back together. See, was that so hard? Why didn't you just talk to each other 20 minutes ago? Oh, that's right, because then the movie would be over too soon. Oh, and Brooke's mom has finally gone off radio silence and wired her a million dollars, which she probably earned running drugs or selling her body or something. But hey, the important thing is Brooke has money again! and she immediately celebrates with a shopping spree and going out for a night of dancing with Kitty. Meanwhile, Elizabeth and Rodney, who are probably as bored with this movie as I am and want it to end as soon as possible, arrange for the men to show up at the same club. Mix them all together, and what have you got? Just a picture of me without you. Yeah, you all know where this is going. There's a big song and dance, Elizabeth is with Rodney, Johnny is with Kitty, Mike is with Brooke, there's more dancing, and it's at long last over. At long last, love is worse than bad. It's dull. Unlike the musicals it draws inspiration from, it doesn't have any strong musical sequences, amusing characters, or anything else to hold up the weak plot. The black and white production design is attractive, and Cole Porter's work is delightful as always, but overall the movie is a tedious slog from one scene to the next, and while the live singing doesn't exactly detract from the whole package, it doesn't really add anything to it either. The movie is so tiresome, I don't even want to bother punishing any of the cast and crew for it. Besides, I figure having to make this mess was probably punishment enough. I will, however, condemn the superficial, self-absorbed characters to experience the real 1930s America by transplanting them into a John Steinbeck book. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs>